Hello, pen friends. Welcome to another episode of The Pen Habit and another review video. So, a little story before we begin. When I was in high school, or the, when I was growing up, I lived in this little town in South Central Michigan, a little town called Albion. And Albion uh, was 10,000 people. It was situated on the freeway, smack dab in between a larger town called Jackson and a town called Battle Creek. And if any of you eat Kellogg's cereal, you've probably read the name Battle Creek on the side of the box. That's where, that's where Kellogg's is headquartered. So I grew up in this little town. And this little town had nothing of note in it. It was, it was a small town and uh, it was not doing real well financially and, and economically. So it was not you know, that was not the kind of place you'd find a real high-end pen store, for instance. So in any case, when I was in high school and got my license, my friends and I would go to, to the movies on the weekend. I'm a huge movie buff and have been since I turned 16 and got my license. And would dr we'd drive to either Jackson or Battle Creek to go see movies. And usually we'd get there a couple hours early and go to the mall or grab some dinner, do something like that. And one of the things I loved to do was go walk around the office supply stores. Now, we didn't have any really fancy pen stores or stationary stores in this part of the country. We, had, we just had the big box stores like Staples or Office Max or Office Depot. And so I loved going to these stores and, you know, get looking at the notebooks or I loved pens of any kind. Even back then, it, I wasn't as serious about them as I am now. And most of what I was just like, I just want a ballpoint or a roller ball that works better than, you know, the, the cheap Bic sticks. In those days, most of these stores had a display cabinet up near the front of the store or back with the pens that was the high-end writing instrument. So the fountain pens or the, the gift sets of roller balls, uh, that sort of thing. And it was usually cross pens, maybe a Waterman pen or two, uh, but you know nothing, nothing you would consider a, a, a luxury writing instrument. These days here in the U.S., these office supply stores rarely carry any fountain pens at all. But back in those days, they had some fountain pens in stock. And I remember, you know, looking at them. That was kind of the first time I, I realized that fountain pens were even a thing, that, that that was, I mean, I remember seeing in cartoons, you know, where they'd suck up the ink with the little lever fillers and stuff like that. But I hadn't realized that that was, I just thought that was something that wasn't made anymore. So I remember looking at those, man, I wish I could get one of those, but I never did. You know, cut to 20, 25 years later and I get my first fountain pen and it's all downhill from there. So when I got into the fountain pen hobby, the first thing I did is I went to the local office supply stores and there were no fountain pens, period. No, none of my local stores had fountain pens until I discovered my, my fountain pen store that eventually ended up closing. And so I was, I was really disappointed. I went to buy a new chair for the studio here a couple weeks ago. And when I did, I saw a display of a very inexpensive Cross fountain pen. Now Cross does not have a great name in the fountain pen community, especially for the really low end stuff, but it was 20 bucks. I hadn't seen a fountain pen in a big box store for a long time. And I thought, I wanna give this a try. So what I got was this pen. This is the Cross Calais. It's originally about $40. It was on sale for 20 bucks. I picked it up when I went through the line with my new office chair, which by the way, I love. <laughs> and uh, and I, I thought it would be interesting to give this a go. For those of you who don't have access to stores and when you're just first getting into the hobby, sometimes you wanna go to a, a, a store and just pick something up right then and there. You don't wanna have to wait for shipping. And if you can find pens in the stores, in the big box stores, this is usually the kind of pen you're gonna find. So let's see if it's worth getting one of these. So this is the Cross Calais. It is a brass pen, very thin bodied brass pen. We'll get to that in a little bit with a blue matte finish. I don't believe the blue matte finish is made anymore looking on their website. They do have other finishes that appear to still be in active production. I don't know if this one is. I couldn't find it on their website. The top has a little silver finial with a little line cut into the side. The clip has the word cross on it. Pretty blah clip. My, I, I don't love this clip for a couple reasons. First, it's extremely stiff. It's, it would be very difficult to clip this over the edge of your jeans or something like that. The other problem is that it is one of those clips that is 
you know, it's, they cut tabs or cut little slots into the side of the cap and then kind of bend tabs around. And I have not had good luck with those because I fiddle with my pens a lot or I use the, the, the clip as a, if this were a screw top, to as a, a pivot point almost or a, a fulcrum point. That's not the right word, but you know what I'm going for. So a lot of times I worry about those getting loose and, and I, don't, I don't like that style of clip attachment, never have. Cap expands out, comes to a flush meeting of the barrel here. The barrel has a little silver colored band in it and then tapers down pretty sharply to a flat-ish, rounded flat. It's not really even finial, it's like a plug. So if I had to guess about the way this is manufactured, and, and I'm not a mechanical engineer, but if I had to guess, my hunch is that they they stamp this very thin brass out over a, a die, and then they cut the ends off and put this little plug in. It doesn't look integrated. It's too big, frankly, for the end cap. It's not very attractive. It's In general, the pen feels pretty flimsy. This is not it, it's quite lightweight, but that lightweight comes with some flimsy feeling to it. So anyway, it is a pop-top cap. Cap comes off. It, it does kind of click into place. You can hear it here. But it, it doesn't, it's not super secure. So I, this is a pen I don't really feel comfortable putting in my pants pocket or even my shirt pocket because I'd be afraid that the cap would come off. It doesn't feel super secure. Underneath the... You've got a brass, you can see how the thin the brass is here looking at the cap, and it has a little plastic liner on the inside. And then you've got this long section which tapers down, a little silver flange here, and then a, quite a small steel nib with the cross logo on it. Now, this pen does not come with a converter. I don't own any cross converters, but if I did, I'm fairly certain they would fit on this pen. One downside to this particular pen is that it uses proprietary converters, and these are not gigantic converters, or cartridges, excuse me. I mean, they're longer than they look, but they're still quite small, and they're really hard to find. So I actually, when I looked, went to go look in the store to see if they even stocked the cartridges for this pen, they don't. So I would have to go online to try to find cross cartridges, and I don't know a lot of retailers that carry co cross pens. I suspect you could probably find the cartridges without too much difficulty, but it's likely that once you run out of ink, you'd have to fill these cartridges with a syringe rather than being able to just run back to that same store and buy the carts. And that's actually a, a good aside for us to, take, to talk about for just a second, which is when you go to a big box store like this and you get a pen from a place that doesn't sell fountain pens, I mean, they sell them, but that's not their, their bailiwick. That's not a thing for them. Before you buy it, always, always, always make sure that you know you can get the, the converters or the cartridges you need to use this pen. If you want something really simple like cartridges for your pen, but you can't buy them, you may be signing yourself up for more, than you, more effort than you want it to take. So just keep that in mind. So that is the basic design of the pen. There are a couple problems right away that I, one of them I mentioned already, which is the kind of the cap feels flimsy. Another one is that this pen doesn't post well. You have to really cram it down there to post. Um, it'll post, but not, not well, and you have to put a lot of effort into it. I don't like that. The other big problem that I have is this lacquer finish is not very durable. I've only had this pen for a couple of weeks, and already, and it's going to be very hard to see, I'll have a picture that I'll cut in, but already it's starting to wear away from the edge of the clip here. And you can see they didn't bother taking the lacquer inside. So this is already going to, this is going to flake off. I, I'm already able to tell. It's not going to be a particularly durable finish. And that's really unfortunate because I love the color and I love that kind of powdery matte finish. It's just not very durable. All right. So let me give you the measurements on this pen and then I'm going to show you how it writes. <music>
Okay, this actually is a medium nib. I put a question mark because I wasn't sure. I didn't remember having seen it on the package. The packaging, by the way, just this really flimsy plastic box. You, you know, I, it wasn't even worth showing, let alone keeping. So I tossed it because it was, you know, it's it's kind of the the pen fountain pen equivalent of a blister pack. So it wasn't worth showing off. Uh, it is a medium nib. It's a very broad medium nib. I will I will tell you that it is quite a broad nib and. It's quite wet. I'm going to show you this first because I'm, I'm getting close to the end of the ink here. So uh, it's actually quite wetter than it's showing right now for a couple reasons. One, as I mentioned, I'm running almost running out of ink and I didn't want to start a new cartridge. And two, it, uh, it's been sitting for a couple of weeks without use. So it's a little drier than it, it has been in the past. In terms of the feel in the hand, it's... It's actually pretty comfortable. I did a fair bit of writing with this pen and I liked it. I, it's, it fit my hand a lot better than some of the other more popular pens like the Pilot Metropolitan or the Lamy Safari. It actually fit my hand really nicely. And because the barrel walls are so thin, it isn't very heavy. It feels pretty nicely balanced. And the thing I like about it is I can grasp it pretty much anywhere because of the shape of the section. I ended up holding it pretty high up, which helped with the comfort because I could get a, a thicker grip uh, a wider grip diameter by moving further up the, the section than using it down closer to the nib, which would have been too narrow. In terms of the nib itself, the nib is actually, aside from being quite wet, is pretty well adjusted. It is not particularly well polished though. It has an almost unpleasant amount of tooth to it. I'd put this at around a four and a half to a five on my feedback scale, which is more than I like to go with. Uh, so it's not scratchy, but it is not smooth either. It's, it's pretty toothy and it, I don't find the tooth particularly pleasant. It helps when it is wetter, which, you know, happened when I was, the cartridge was new and the ink flow was new. That does take away a little bit of the tooth, but it still is not going to be that buttery smooth feeling some people really like. In terms of reverse writing, it, this is quite scratchy. It is drier, but it does not like the right, ooh, ooh, ooh. It's like scraping your fingernails on a chalkboard. Gross. Uh, so yeah, not the best reverse writer I've ever used. Um, going from right to left. There's no real give to the nib. Um, there's, well, there's a little tiny bit of give to the nib, but it's a pretty inexpensive steel nib. So I wouldn't be expecting a whole lot with this pen. So that is the writing experience. It's pretty pedestrian, not amazing, consistent. It's, it's nice and consistent. If you like a wetter, wider line, this is a pretty good wetter, wider line for an inexpensive pen. But at the same time, it's just not, you can get a much better writing experience with a lot of other pens, even in this price range. So as I mentioned earlier on, the Cross Calais, what, I bought it for 20 bucks. Its price listed on the shelf was 40 bucks. I think they were trying to clearance them out. So I'm going to assume that the list price on this pen is around $40. And I don't normally say it in these in this frame of reference, and I don't normally value it in quite this way, $40 is too much money for this pen. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be that definitive. It's too much money for this pen. It's not that it's a bad writing experience, it's that the construction quality is so poor. This is just not a very well-made pen, especially when you compare it to pens like the Pilot Metropolitan, or the Nemesine Singularity, or even the Lamy Safari, or the Faber-Castell Loom, all four of those pens, I would consider much higher quality pens, and they cost about the same or even less than this pen does. I like the color. The design is very dated. It's very uninspired, very uninteresting. The color is cool, but the, the, it's just not very well built. And having, to have the, the finishing flaking off despite the fact that I'm very careful with my pens and I've only been using it for a few weeks, that's just, it's not acceptable to me, even at a low price point. If you can't build it well, just don't build it at all.
or as my dad often says, if it's not worth doing, it's not worth doing right. Uh, so there you go. <laughs> so anyway, this has been the, my review of the Cross Calais. I feel like it is pens like this that have given Cross a bad name it does not always deserve. My experience with the Cross Century 2, when I reviewed that a while back, was that it was a really nice pen and one far above and beyond what I was expecting to get from the pen when I got it. I've never tried some of their larger pens like the Townsend or any of those, but I've heard very good things about those pens as well. But when the introduction to the brand is something that is poorly made, doesn't, you know, doesn't feel good to write with and is not durable, that hurts the whole brand. This is one of those things where I feel like it would be better for them not to make this pen at all because I feel like making this pen would probably end up driving people away from the hobby as opposed to introducing them and bringing them on board and encouraging them to get better pens. So I am not a fan of the Cross Calais. I, I'm, I'm going to go out on a record and say that. So anyway, thank you so much for watching. I do appreciate you being here. And of course, don't forget to check out penhabit.com. You can see the link to the written review in the notes below, including some additional photos. Get up close and personal with the finish on the pen and see how the nib is ground and some of that stuff. Don't forget to check out the Pen Habit web shop as well to check out the Inky Fingers notebook line. We've got the, we still have some of the uh, factory seconds at a reduced price there so you can get them. And we should start seeing, uh, we should start seeing some of these pop up in some European retailers very shortly too. I've, I've been in conversations with some European retailers. So if you don't follow me on Facebook or Twitter, I would highly suggest you do so, so you can get announcements uh, when these notebooks are going to become available overseas so you don't have to pay ridiculous amounts for shipping them from the U.S. So that should do it for this episode. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you here next time on The Pen Habit. Bye.